Hi there, my name is Rob Woodbridge. I'm here on behalf of the LBMA, and we are sitting down with John Fisher, who's the chairman and CEO of uh, DMTI. Uh, with me is Asif Khan, who is actually the founder of the LBMA. Asif, welcome. Thanks, Rob. And of course, we have John Fisher, uh, who is the uh, chairman and CEO of DMTI. John, thanks for doing this with us. My pleasure, Rob. Well, let's get right into this. I, I think the first question that I always ask is, Give us a brief overview of what DMTI is. What exactly is DMTI? DMTI is a company in the location intelligence space, and our specialty is an area we call master address management. So we specialize in teasing the address component out of databases, cleaning it up, unifying it, and uh, making corporate uh, solutions out of that. Okay, and and. So when you think about what your key differentiators are in the marketplace, uh, do, you have, uh, do you have a laundry list or is there one thing that you can hang your hat on? Well, I'd say three things. So first and foremost, uh, I talked about master address management. We're really the 800-pound gorilla in that space. We have a platform called Location Hub, and uh, that provides the fundamental framework uh, for teasing out that location component piece. Almost uh, all information, as you know, is has a location component in it, about 85% of all the information in the world. And a lot of that information is in the form of an address, civic address, postal address, and so on. And so in order to connect information and make it useful, you need to be able to tease that component out. The only issue is that that's often a very dirty piece of information. Because we all use uh, addresses every day, we think we know what they should be, uh, but in fact, when you actually start looking at them, they vary an awful lot. And so, when you try and match things together, then you end up with a lot of uh, error. Either they don't match or false positives. So we've uh, spent a lot of uh, time building the capability of teasing that out uh, and then comparing it against a reference database and being able to make a definitive match. Once you do that, you remove a, a huge percentage of the error, and uh, that allows you to create a much more compelling solution. So that was one. Yep. Uh, number two is that uh, we tightly couple the data with the, uh, the software, and that we feel is a really important piece. There are a lot of companies out there that produce some very good software, but there's only so much you can do with that because often the problems they run into are data problems. And, and so uh, if, unless you have really, really good data, then uh, you will end up missing out on a whole bunch of uh, potential there. So at the same time, we produce uh, really solid reference data sets. And then we put the two together very tightly so that uh, we're able to take advantage of all of the idiosyncrasies of the reference data and uh, in the software itself. So it, it ends up having a much more complete solution. I mentioned there were three. The third one is our distillation database. And so what we did was uh, we determined that uh, long ago, about 15 years ago, that we didn't want to go out and do the traditional thing of collecting all the data from scratch. We figured that, well, for one thing, as soon as you've done that, it changes and, and you might not know that until the next time you go out and collect again. But also that there was just a tremendous amount of high quality data out there and we wanted to take advantage of it. And so what we did is we built uh, something we called uh, well, the latest re rendition of it, which we're just releasing this week, is the distillation database. But uh, conceptually, we call it the data hopper. So it's like this giant funnel. And you put all of the different sources in the top. It goes through an integration engine and so on. That removes the redundancy, cleans it all up, links it together, and creates a really solid uh, reference database that you can use to compare anything else to. And because it's dependent upon these thousands of different data sets, we have over 7,000 different incoming data streams on a continuous basis. It can be kept up to date every day. So you, you kind of take the information, which, is, which could be dirty information, you bring it in, 
you clean it, and then the outcome of this is obviously clean data that people can actually use. Is that is that a good way to, to summarize that? That's absolutely correct. We call it making a silk purse out of a sow's ear. <laughs> so true. Well, one of the biggest challenges, obviously, the normalization of that data, because it comes in so many different factors or di different formats, and and certainly addresses um, are, are the are the dirtiest of all dirty data. I would say when it comes to location, it's not clean. So, what about uh, let's talk about Location Hub? Uh, can you is that what you've just described? Is is the outcome is Location Hub? It's a combination of the two components: distillation databases, where we bring in all the thousands of different data sets and resolve them into one. Uh, one continuous integrated whole, that then is used to provision the reference data for Location Hub, which is the actual engine for matching incoming data streams and so on. And, and how, how is this going to change the market? It, it sounds pretty, sounds simple in execution, but, but it's not. But it's fundamental uh, in, in terms of, it's a fundamental need, isn't it? Absolutely, uh, because it's the underpinning for pretty much all location intelligence and GIS. Unless you can get the data right, unless you can position it properly, then nothing else works. Now, there is a, another factor here which I think is worth uh, teasing out, and that is that the very same technology that we use to produce this distillation database is the same technology that is very useful internally within companies to bring together the disparate silos of information that they have there. So uh, we recognized this uh, years ago because customers started saying, well, if you can do this internally, can't you do it for us as a service? And, and we said, well, that makes a lot of sense. So that's when we decided to productize Location Hub and make that available externally. Yeah. Yeah, so, so John, uh, the question I have for you kind of off the top is, is uh, from, from the Location-Based Marketing Association's perspective, uh, of which you know, we're, we're happy to, uh, to have D DMTI uh, involved with what we're doing now, um, help, me, help me understand how you kind of fit into to kind of our broad philosophy of, of the way we look at location. And so just, just to kind of frame that, you know, we, we describe you know, location um, and, and, you know, the opportunity from a, for a location from a marketer's perspective as this kind of intersection or integration of all media uh, around a location. And so, obviously, the address information and, you know, the physical location and, you know, lat long uh, components are really important as it relates to a building or a venue or a place. But we kind of, you know, to, to kind of look, look a little bit into the future, we would say that, you know, part of, this, of these databases going forward uh, are going to involve, you know, tracking uh, in, in databases like yours, things like billboards. Like a billboard is a location, as far as we're concerned, and will be geotagged. Uh, you know, a bus uh, that, or a moving object, you know, that has media on it, on the side of a bus, as it passes by a particular fixed location, becomes in purview of that location potentially and therefore you know might be part of the mix of how we look at location going forward. W what do you think about that as a concept? Well it's absolutely true that all of these things have a location, they all have relationships to one another. Uh, within the context uh, of the location-based marketing, a good part of that is where are the people and how are they relating to the things around them the, and that's a very volatile situation. There's a, an awful lot of moving pieces that you have to keep track of. But the only way it works really effectively is that if you nail down all of those individual pieces with a, a high degree of, of reliability. So you want to know exactly what that billboard is and what it's got on it and where it's facing and where the customer is looking at it from. But you also yeah. want to know... Uh, a ton of other information about the context. Are they in a store? What kind of store is it? What, what are they likely there for? And all of those pieces are very dependent uh, on being very reliably connected. And uh, the second piece is not just how positionally accurate they are, but the, the content. So all of the attribution around, for example, the restaurant. And those pieces are, uh, all have to be integrated effectively, and that's where we see the foundation piece.
And, and so just, just to close out that thought, I mean, do you see then uh, kind of a future of adding non-physical place information into, into databases and, 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 and or I guess potentially bringing new feeds in on top of your 7,000 that you referenced already? You know, do you see new feeds that kind of bring uh, other media types, other other data sets, and and kind of matching that up against you know kind of you know the stuff that you guys have been doing you know for you know twenty years almost. Absolutely, uh, and in fact, that's a, a big part of the next phase of the company. Something uh, we call data federation. So, because we've got the engine there, because we've got the reference data there, then any data set, any data feed, whether it's individual locations of people or assets or, or events can be fed through the engine and uh, locked onto location. As soon as they are, we actually assign them unique location IDs and those b then become an indexing method for relating all of the different pieces. So uh, it really facilitates that whole process of connecting the information. So, you know, what we've seen in, in the marketplace, uh, you know, that has emerged, that's kind of put a location on the map. It's a terrible analogy. My apologies. But uh, is the uh, are the guys like Foursquare and Facebook who are who are kind of bringing location out to the consumer really quickly uh, beyond a GPS? Um, and one of the biggest problems that we've seen over the last number of years that these guys have been around is that. Um, Accuracy is one of the biggest challenges that they've had. Uh, you, you know, you can uh, be at a location on a street corner and tag it as that location, but it's really not that location. And there are three or four different people who have tagged that location, um, you know, from a foot away or a, a mile away. How do you how do you um, deal with that? By I mean, how do you harness the power of what you guys have, which is uh, years and years, twenty plus years of of data collection on locations, and and start to disperse this out to the to the rest of the community? How do you solve this problem of of data normalization or location normalization? It's a very good question, and in fact, it underscores the whole this whole area of crowdsourcing, which is uh, getting a lot of attention these days. Uh, it, it, it's tr potentially a tremendously valuable set of input data into the, the whole process, but as you've indicated, there's a tremendous amount of error in it. And so how do you separate out uh, the bits uh, that have error and, and how do you normalize all of that information? Our whole approach has always been to then have a very solid framework of reference data that everything gets referred to. So the more things that you know, the more precise you can be about the things you don't know, and the better you can fit new bits of information into it. And so uh, we have always had to deal with this problem of ambiguity. And in fact, we talk about what we do as the mitigation of ambiguity. So it's the removing of the slop out of the system. So uh, we look for the commonalities. We uh, so we, we create both positive and negative indexes. So what are the things that are similar in the input stream to the reference data? What are the things that are dissimilar? How do those uh, weigh out in the overall equation? And, uh, and so we just weed, refine and refine and refine until we get uh, closer matching. The other thing we can do is we can uh, put back the exceptions. So if somebody goes to input some data, and we detect error in it, we can immediately provide a feedback stream that says, you, you said this, but these bits don't correlate. Did you mean this? And, uh, and help in the process of refining that data. That's so important, especially when you've got such a, you know, you've got growing databases across all these other companies that are collecting that same information. And, and uh, you know, I think that you know, there's you and there's Esri and PBBI and a bunch of these other companies that have, have these massive databases of locations. And then you have that new layer, which is the Foursquare and Facebook and Yelp and Gowal and all those guys. Um, it's very important to be able to bring that, um, bring some kind of semblance of, of uh, commonality across those locations that they're all collecting. Absolutely. Uh, there's all of this data contributes, and the more pieces you put in, the better the result. 
However, what you want to avoid is getting porridge out of the process. And so very important to, uh, to nail down uh, things that you can know definitively. Uh, there's another dimension here we haven't really talked about, which is the temporal dimension. So things change over time. That doesn't mean that they weren't valid at some point in time. And so we actually dimension our data that way to track what's the historical information, when did it change, is it what's the most legitimate uh, answer today, and so on. So that provides a mechanism for combining things that might have happened in some time in the past. And all databases contain historical information, along with the very temporal information, contemporary information that you'll get from a Gwala or Foursquare. Okay, so so John, um, you know, you, you mentioned this this concept of kind of the future of, of data federation. Um, you, one of the things that we've we've heard about recently in the last week or so uh, is Foursquare at, at the South by Southwest conference in in their kind of keynote address announced a uh, an initiative that they're calling the Venue Harmonization Project, and it's an attempt by I, the leader you know as far as the new guard of of kind of place databases is concerned. Uh, to um, make an attempt to solve a problem that uh, we at the LBMA have can, kind of been looking at for the last few months. And, and the problem is that in the new world of, of you know, kind of all of these consumer-oriented uh, check-in or location services, the, so the Foursquares, the Gualas, the Yelps, the Google Places, Facebook Places, etc., every one of these guys has proprietary database structure today in terms of how they store that location information. Um, and as Rob alluded to in, in, in his earlier comments, you know, sometimes we have duplicate uh, information because consumers are generating these, these location, uh, um, you, you know, locations within these, uh, within these proprietary databases. And so one of the things that, you know, there, there's kind of two parts to this problem as we've seen it. So part one is, is if you're the business owner, you have to go and manage your, your location profile, your business listing information in multiple places. You know, it's not like the old days where you just go put it in the yellow pages and you're done. Now you've got to update your profile in Yelp and Foursquare and Google and everywhere else. And so that's, that can become a full, bit of a full-time job. You know, your phone number changes, you've got to go change it in 17 places. And on the other side, if somebody's trying to build uh, a third-party application, you know, a developer out there, uh, or, or a business wants to leverage, uh, you know, a wide data set, uh, they have to then go and work with, you know, 17 different APIs uh, because they're all proprietary. And so, you know, Foursquare has basically said, okay, we're going to, you know, we acknowledge this problem somewhat. And, you know, since we're the biggest and the best, uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, kind of make our API available and, you know, make our, uh, our database available to everybody and we hope others will contribute into it. We don't think that's going to work, um, and uh, that's the LBMA's view on it. We think that um, you know there's a need for a, a kind of a neutral body, the LBMA or some other uh, body, to administer some sort of a third-party uh, system and have everybody kind of contribute data into that basic business listing information. What what do you think? Uh, you know, what role number one can DMTI play in something like that? Um, and you know, obviously, you have oodles and oodles of data. You have 7,000 plus sources of data. You've got, you know, a, a system that you've perfected over the years for cleansing uh, that data and making sure that it's accurate and, you know, and deduped and so on and so forth. So I, I think you have, you know, potentially a lot to say about it, but I'd, I'd love to hear it. Well, first of all, I think it is a very significant issue. If, unless we can unify this information, it, it, there will be an awful lot of questions about is what uh, this observation A or this uh, location A really the same as location B or are they two different ones and so on, which does, it certainly complicates the problem tremendously. And uh, also for business owners and so on trying to keep their information up to date, yes, having to update many, many different sources is, is uh, an overwhelming overhead for them. So the concept of having a unified database and one a one source makes a lot of sense. Uh, whether Foursquare can uh, do it a, as a an individual proprietor and, and then get everybody to rally around that, that's a difficult 
thing to do because you've got a lot of direct competitors that will be affected by that. Uh, whether the association can do it as uh, a common neutral third party, a uh, very interesting concept. Our interest uh, is as a technology provider to make that all happen because I think that we've got the the techniques, the, the methodologies and the system that would make that uh, work very well. Um, we're happy to support the activity. Okay, um, and so, sort of the last question for me, and I think, you know, Rob, I don't know if, if, if you've got anything else you, you wanted to get into, but uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on, John, is, uh, you know, still stay, sticking with this kind of new world of, of kind of consumer-oriented location services. We, we've kind of, in the last year or so, uh, we've, we've kind of moved or shifted in terms of the function that uh, some of these uh, companies are starting to provide in terms of the value that they're providing to consumers. So we started, when we started with Foursquares and the Bright Kites and the, the early guys, it was about checking in the consumers basically, you know, saying, you know, I'm here and that information being broadcasted out to a subset of friends who are following them, same as things like Twitter and so on and so forth, or Facebook uh, status updates. Um, and that's kind of, that was interesting, and we had a bit of a gaming element to that, and it was m maybe fun for some people, and, and, and there's still some of that going on, but it hasn't really been enough to sustain the business or to grow uh, enough of a user base. And so the next wave, what we've seen over the last kind of three or four months now and what Rob and I have talked about with a lot of the folks, other folks that we've, we've interviewed is this kind of next wave of, of what's called recommendation engines and and so what that's all about is is these companies, the Foursquares and, and like, uh, are now collecting a lot of data about who's going where, who's checking in where, where their friends are checking into um, and they're in a position to basically make recommendations uh, to people based on, on where they're checking in as to where they should go and you know maybe you should try this restaurant tonight or maybe you should do this or here's a great place to hang out or there's an event going on and so that's kind of interesting but to, to kind of go a step further you know maybe towards the end of this year I think the next wave that we see coming the next trend we see coming is predictive analytics you know not where you're going or what we recommend you see but we know where you're going to go next based on your patterns. And I think, you know, DM2I potentially uh, could help in that. I mean, you certainly provide that as a service to some of your customers, do you not? Absolutely. And uh, so you raised a number of issues, actually. As if maybe I can deal with them, uh, tease them apart a bit. So the, the first one is that uh, you're talking about the check-in process and having to input a bunch of information in order to make some of these tools useful. And in the beginning of any technology, uh, the early adopters are fairly tolerant of the, the issues and difficulty of working with a, a system. But as it becomes more mature and you get uh, the early majority and late majority adopting the technology, they're much less tolerant of all of that overhead. And so the system itself has to be able to provide a lot of that information and more passive uh, input is acceptable. So, where this you don't have to do a lot of stuff in order to to be a participant, it basically just happens because you're carrying around the device or or you're using it for your own purpose. So that really depends upon having better and better information, better codified and better capabilities in the technology in order to make suggestions, as you were saying and and provide something that's of real use to the, the consumer. No, I think that I think that makes perfect sense. So, you know, w what can you provide, or or how do you see the predictive side of things folding into that? Well, uh, our technology has uh, we focus as a company pr primarily on a direct basis with large enterprise clients, and so we supply that technology to them. But we've recognized for some time that there's a much broader audience for this and a much broader set of applications. And so uh, the way that we're addressing that is uh, we're rolling out our dev hub, which is our developer zone. And so we're exposing our tools to third party developers and, and uh, other solution providers so they can integrate the technology into their solutions. So uh, th those very same tools that we use 
uh, whether it's predictive analytics or, or the address management, are now available to uh, any of these players, Foursquare or, or uh, companies internally, or to develop and incorporate those into their own offerings. That that to me is uh, is uh, is an amazing thing, simply because um, companies like you guys have been around for so long collecting this data. And uh, it seems like every company and every generation who gets into this space feels the need to start over again and start to accumulate their own databases and their own content around location. And, and you know, Asif and I have talked about this many times, that location is dial tone now. And what we need to be able to do is, is get beyond location and start putting that smart layer on top of location. And so if, if companies like you uh, can bring that data and just say, okay, here it is, this is the data, here's some uh, intelligence on top of that data, and here's some analytics on top of that data, now go and innovate. I think that this is, uh, you know, let, let the data speak for itself and be normalized, and then let those companies go out and, um, and leverage that data to, for, some, for, some, for some greater good, shall we say. So kudos to you guys for doing that. Well, exactly. Don't reinvent the wheel. The really interesting stuff comes now that with the platform and everything available, now go off and do something that's really of interest to the end, end customer. Absolutely. Well, this, is, this has been great. Uh, you know, I, I feel that um, you know, we, we've probably taken a, a layer off of what DMTI is and, and, and exposed it a little bit more. And so, John, I really appreciate you, you coming on and, and, and sharing a little bit more about what, what it is DMTI is doing. Um, and especially around the launch, uh, we really appreciate your time during this busy, busy, uh, busy week for you guys. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk to you, and, and I wish all success to the association in uh, in propagating this uh, whole technology and capability out into the marketplace. Thanks, John. We're uh, we're glad to have you on board, and uh, look forward to uh, to working with you uh, in the uh, the months to come. Great. We've been speaking with John Fisher, who's the chairman and CEO of DM DMTI. My name is Rob Woodridge, and uh, with Asif Khan on behalf of the LBMA, thank you for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.